It is my distinct privilege to introduce our guest speaker tonight. Tara Harmer-Luke is an associate professor of biology at Stockton University. Stockton is a public liberal arts college in New Jersey. It's just outside of Atlantic City. Uh, Tara earned her Bachelor of Arts in Biology with a specialization in marine biology at Boston College, Boston University, and a PhD in molecular biology from Johns Hopkins University. She then studied deep sea hyperthermal vents as a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University. Uh, by the way, she twice went down in the submersible called Alvin, if you know what that is. Uh, Alvin is the deep sea thermal vent uh, submarine that she's been down uh, more than 2,500 meters, which if you know, that's a mile and a half down in the ocean, collecting the, those uh, uh, tube worms that grow at the thermal vents. Currently, her research focuses on invertebrate and microbial diversity of artificial reefs and shipwrecks off the coast of New Jersey. One quick fact just to tell you if you're interested and you want to ask her a question about it, Tara is also the head coach of the Stockton University Quidditch team. <laughs> and by the way, the, the Quidditch team there, their mascot is the Osprey, so it is the Order of the Osprey, and she's the head coach. So Tara Harmer-Luke. So thank you for inviting me. Um, this is actually my first time in Utah, and it is a beautiful state. Um, and again, I'm really happy to be here. So I'm going to actually be talking about some of the research that I'm doing with undergraduate students at Stockton. So everything I'm going to be talking about is things that, uh, again, um, first, second, third, or fourth year students um, are actually working on. Okay. So we, I study underwater ecosystems. Um, that's kind of my primary area of interest. And you can't really study deep ecosystems by just kind of sticking your hands in the water and pulling things out. So we need to use um, various types of technology in order to do that. One type of technology that we use is scuba. So for shallow areas, we can actually scuba dive. Um, we can dive down to ecosystems. We can collect samples and so on that way. We can also use technology like sonar, which basically uses sound to produce pictures so you can get a sense for what it is that you're looking at. Um, and that's one of the tools that we use as well. And finally, we can use underwater vehicles. And um, depending on how deep you're looking, um, you use different types of vehicles. Um, as Tim said, um, if you want to study deep sea hydrothermal vents, you need to use something like the deep submergence vehicle Alvin, um, which can go down about 4,000 meters. Um, outside off the coast of New Jersey, it doesn't get quite that deep, so we use other technology. Um, on the top right, we have a small uh, remotely operated vehicle, an ROV, called the Shearwater, and this is um, an ROV that we use at Stockton, and undergraduates actually get to learn how to drive it and everything. The other remotely operated vehicle that I have up there is um, a NOAA vehicle, and NOAA actually um, has programs where they send this particular ROV out, and then they project um, the images back to shore. And students at universities and colleges and even high schools can actually be involved in collecting data firsthand. Okay, so the obvious question, why do we need this technology to study um, marine environments? And clearly, when we're talking about really, really deep areas, it makes sense. But if you're sitting there next to the ocean, and unless you're somewhere tropical where the water is really super clear, you're not really going to see anything from the surface. But just below the surface, even if you don't know something is there, there is all sorts of things that you can explore. Um, this is um, an XKCD comic. And um, it's one of my favorites because it really shows that there is a lot of things in the, in the underwater um, world to actually explore. And as our earlier speaker pointed out, three quarters of the planet is covered in water. 
So um, being able to actually explore that is really important. So when I was a postdoc and I studied um, deep organisms at hydrothermal vents um, with Alvin, um, as I moved to a smaller college, that's kind of an expensive sort of proposition. So we're actually able to do some things on a smaller scale because we have our remotely operated vehicle. So I'm gonna tell you a bit about some of the work that we're doing on artificial reefs. And this involves, again, exploring. It also involves molecular biology. Um, it involves marine science. And it involves marine technology as well. So we have our ROV. Um, it's very small. It can only go down to about 300 meters, but that's quite a bit deeper than a human can go. And we launch it off of a boat, um, and we have undergraduate students who actually help and they participate. We control it from a small computer um, in the, on the ship. Um, that green is the reel of um, basically the tether that actually, we have 300 meters of that tether, so we can actually go out 300 meters. We've not actually had it go quite that far so far. We've stuck to areas that are shallow enough that we can actually send scuba divers down in case there's a problem. We don't want to lose the sub. So off the coast of New Jersey, um, we have oceans, obviously. Um, and the water is very murky. Um, you can't see very far. You can't see very well in the water. In fact, if you stand in the water up to about your knees, you really can't see your feet. So um, you need to have some other way of finding your way around than using vision. Our ROV has these great cameras on it, but when there's not very much light and there's a lot of particles in the water, you really can't see anything. So what we do is we use sonar in order to locate objects. This artificial reef project started as a collaboration between um, molecular biologists and marine biologists, fish biologists who were really, really interested in um, some of the larger fish, um, the game fish, that um, are important for recreational fishing. And we know that areas that have some sort of a hard surface, like a shipwreck, um, attract fish. And no one had actually ever done any studies where you actually looked at these reefs, tried to figure out which of these types of artificial reefs were um, better suited to different types of fish. And no one had ever done these studies over the long term. So when we got this ROV, we thought, oh, this will be really neat. Let's go down and see what we have. So we used sonar to actually find these shipwrecks. Um, this is a forward-looking sonar directly from the ROV. We also have a side scan sonar, which you tow behind the boat um, that you can see larger areas. And I'll show you some images from that in a little bit as well. So this is a shipwreck. Um, the ship was called the Jesse C. Um, it's been underwater for maybe about 20 years or so. And one of the capabilities of our inspection class ROV is we can take video. So when we were looking at these wrecks, one of the things that really interested us was the fact that we have these corals. Um, and we were kind of interested in trying to figure out whether the corals we find on one artificial reef, on one shipwreck, are the same as you find on others. We know they're the same species, but we were trying to figure out whether or not there are molecular differences in the um, nucleotide sequences. So um, we started this project looking at the northern star coral, Astrangia poculata. And it's found in the coastal Atlantic between about 30. It can go up to about 30 meters deep. Um, and it's a coral. It's an animal that actively feeds. It takes in food. But it also has symbiotic um, dinoflagellates that are um, able to use sunlight. They're photoautotrophs. They can use sunlight to produce food, which they can then use, and then they can pass on some of that to the um, corals themselves. So that's why I got interested in this project. So I want to give you an idea of where we're actually collecting our samples. Here is the um, northeast of the United States. And here is the region that we'll be working in. <clears throat> 
So we chose several sites, um, several shipwrecks that are known. Um, these shipwrecks are different ages. Some of them were sunk intentionally to provide um, artificial reef structure. Others were sunk accidentally. So um, we collected coral samples. We went scuba diving, collected a bunch of samples from all of these sites. And again, we started this project looking at how genetically variable these population of Estrangia poculata are. Now, this is a project that we do in our class, I'm sorry, in our research labs, um, but this is also a project that we do in our upper level molecular biology classes. So instead of our upper level molecular lab actually having a lab manual and you do a different lab every week, over the course of the semester, students actually took these samples and processed them and basically got um, real data that um, no one had actually done before. So the samples were collected um, by diving. So these wrecks that we looked at um, were, were not beyond the depth that we can actually dive. And basically you take a, a dive knife and you kind of pry off a chunk of coral. And then we brought it back to the lab. Now, these, the students that worked on these were molecular biology majors. So most of them don't scuba dive. They didn't actually collect the samples. I basically brought them to class. Um, and what the students did was they extracted genomic DNA. So they basically took each individual little coral polyp and they digested it and ended up with DNA, so genetic material from each of these. They then used a technique called polymerase chain reaction. Um, or PCR, which allows them to amplify a small region of that genome. We then took that small region of the genome and cloned it into bacteria, um, transformed it into um, E. coli, and we sequenced it. So basically, we used an automated sequencer, and um, we were able to figure out the nucleotide sequence of these um, organisms, and we chose Gene, a gene um, called the 18S ribosomal RNA gene. And this gene is found in all eukaryotes. A very similar gene, the 16S ribosomal RNA gene, is found in prokaryotes. So um, it's something that all organisms have to have to actually make proteins. So anyway, we sequenced this gene, um, and we got all of these A's, G's, T's, and C's. And the next thing we did is we did something called a BLAST search. And BLAST stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. And what it does is it takes a nucleotide sequence and it compares it to a database that has all of the known DNA sequences that anybody has ever sequenced, at least, and then um, deposited in this repository. So we took our sequences um, one at a time and we compared them to everything everybody else has done. And we came up with a lot of hits that matched, or at least were very close. Um, and we then took those hits and built a um, sequence alignment. And you've seen a few posters and presentations today doing these similar techniques, using BLAST, building sequence alignments. Um, we actually compared our samples from all of these shipwrecks to known coral sequences. And at this point, we were pretty sure we had Astrangia, the northern star coral, but this really confirmed that we did. After we lined these sequences up and um, compared them, the next step in analysis is to build a phylogenetic tree. And what that does is it looks at this sequence, our series of sequences, and it builds a um, mathematical model that gives you an idea of which organisms or which sequences are the most closely related to each other. And basically what we found is the sequences from our corals, um, from all of the different shipwreck sites, were really, really close to each other. Um, they were also really, really close to Estrangia poculata, which we would expect since that's what we think they are. But there were a couple of other corals that they matched pretty well as well. So what this tells, told us is that this is really interesting. We have all of these corals, um, and they're very closely related, but we can't use this particular region of the gene to get any more um, specific detail. So we can't figure out 
um, if one shipwreck is different than another shipwreck. So we would have to use a different region of the gene. So this, pro this project is actually ongoing. So, <coughs> excuse me, right now, what students are doing is looking at a more highly variable region of this gene um, and trying to find specific differences between local populations. And of course, when we first started, we had these grand ideas that we're going to characterize all of these different shipwrecks, which is a really cool plan. But um, what we found is it made a little bit more sense to focus on a couple of them. So we're focusing on two specific sites. Um, one is called the Almirante, and one is called the Robert J. Walker. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about these projects um, in a minute. But the Almirante was a steamship freighter. It was actually traveling from New York to, um, I think it was um, Panama, carrying um, supplies. And it sank in 1918. And this actually, this wreck has often been referred to as the flower wreck because shortly after it wrecked, all of this white stuff um, appeared up on shore. And it turns out, this ship was full of vegetables, and they had fermented, and basically that's what was washing up. But for a long time, they thought it was flour. Anyway, um, so the Almirante, again, has been underwater for about 100 years, so it's pretty well colonized. We were actually able to take some pretty good side scan sonar images. Um, and a side scan sonar basically is it sort of looks like a torpedo, and you tow it behind the ship, and basically it sends out sound waves. And when they bounce back, the pattern gives you an idea of what the seafloor looks like. So we were actually able to see specific portions of the shipwreck. Um, so we were able to actually narrow down on various parts um, to try and figure out where we wanted to collect samples. Um, it's important that this was a metal hauled ship. Um, it's important for the next project. I had a student um, who worked in my lab, who, by the way, was also on the Quidditch team. Um, anyway, um, he was really, really interested in coral growth. And he had read a paper that had suggested that some corals actually seem to grow better um, on surfaces that are electrochemically active. So um, you find um, corals growing faster on metal than you do on wood, for example. And he thought, wow, wouldn't it be really neat to build an experiment around this? So um, he decided he wanted to set up um, an electrochemical gradient. Um, so he basically set up an electric current in a fish tank. Um, we went and collected corals from the wreck of the Almirante, um, set them side by side in two tanks, one with this um, current and one um, without. We took some samples right away. And then about a month later, we collected more samples um, with the idea that we wanted to see if there were any differences between the, um, the, the tank that had a, an electric current passing through it and the one that didn't. And his hypothesis is that he would um, find um, a difference in growth. Well, astrangia is really, really tiny. Um, sometimes they measure growth in corals, but typically they're much larger corals. These are, you know, probably a big one might be the length of my um, pinky fingernail. So measuring growth over the course of a month is really not realistic. So um, we had this idea that we couldn't actually measure the growth, but we might actually be able to measure um, gene expression. We might be able to measure differences in gene expression in each of these two situations. We had just recently gotten a piece of equipment called a next generation sequencer. So we were actually able to um, sequence large amounts of DNA at the same time. So, um, we started this project, um, and we decided to analyze all of the genes that are transcribed in this organism. Um, 
So next generation sequencing, again, is a technique that you can use to sequence a ton of DNA um, at one time. And this project is looking at all of the DNA in a particular organism and then comparing it to all of the DNA in another example of that organism. And basically, the, the necessary steps to do this are to um, remove the DNA, um, I'm sorry, you remove the RNA um, from the organism and you basically um, build something called a, an RNA library. Um, you then take that library and you can make templates, you can use specific um, small pieces of DNA that will stick to the um, solid support in this system. Um, you then run these sequences and then you can analyze them. And again, these are um, projects in progress. And excuse me, at this point, we've only gotten to the library construction stage. But once we continue on with this project, we hope to be able to see a difference in what genes are turned on or turned off in this particular sample. Um, and again, we have several samples waiting um, in the wings to actually be tested. But this particular project was completely designed by an undergraduate student um, in his second year is when he first came up with this project. So we're still working on the Almirante and I have students in my molecular evolution class looking at the coral. I had another student who was in that class who suddenly was really interested in finding all of the other things that you see at these shipwrecks. We had, again, we had a fish biologist who was looking at tautog and um, black sea bass and so on, but um, we were really interested in the small things. So we decided to see what we could find in the sediment of this shipwreck. And back to this next generation sequencing, not only can you sequence all the DNA in one particular organism, you can actually pick a specific gene in, basically pick a specific gene and amplify that in all of the organisms in the sample. So basically um, what we did is we took this sediment sample, so we actually, when we collected the corals for um, the one student's project, we also collected sediment for this other student and brought it back to the lab and she extracted all the DNA from this sample. She then um, processed it in a very similar way um, to the other project. This project has made it a bit farther. Um, she was actually able to um, sequence, basically find the, the amino, sorry, the nucleotide sequence for all of the organisms in that soil sample. And she looked in two different ways. She looked at the 16S ribosomal RNA gene, which are found in prokaryotes, and she looked at the 18S ribosomal RNA gene, which are found in eukaryotes, like animals and things. So she was looking at pretty much everything that you could find there. And I'm going to show you some of her data. She actually collected, <clears throat> when you do metagenomics, and again, this is a really big project that um, you come back with so much data that you could not possibly um, process all of it in one semester. Um, she actually spent a couple of semesters working on this project. But anyway, um, I'm giving you a representative sample. Um, do you remember back when I showed you that DNA sequence alignment of all of those coral sequences that were all pretty much identical? Well, she looked at that same gene from a bunch of different organisms, basically whatever she pulled out of the sediment. And we had some that were very similar and some that were very, very different. Um, she also did the same with the eukaryotic gene, the 18S ribosomal RNA gene, and found similar results. You found some things that were similar, some that were very different. She then built phylogenetic trees, again, um, to model evolutionary history. And basically what she did was she identified many of the organisms that you find in the sediment. Um, and she compared them to other known um, sequences. <clears throat> she did this not just for the prokaryotes, but also for the eukaryotes, and she found things like um, um, algae and um, very small 
animals, so microscopic animals. Um, so there was a lot of really interesting stuff in this. And this was kind of a pilot project. This is one that, um, again, uses molecular biology, uses bioinformatics to analyze these data, um, and it looks at, again, exploring these shipwrecks. And this leads us to um, another project. Um, and this is the wreck of the um, USCS Robert J. Walker. And the Robert J. Walker project is a larger project that has been, um, um, is a partnership between the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, and um, Stockton University and a couple of other um, community partners. And basically, um, the Robert J. Walker was a ship. I'm going to, this is the Robert J. Walker. It's actually a metal hulled paddle wheel boat. Um, and it was built in 1847, it sunk in um, 1860. So, um, 1860 was kind of a, a big tumultuous time in the history of this country. Um, but basically, this particular ship was a survey ship. Um, the U.S. Coast Survey was kind of the organization that um, was the predecessor to NOAA, um, which basically gives you all of your weather forecasts and, and all sorts of things. So anyway, um, this particular ship did a lot of mapping in the Gulf Coast and some other, other locations. But in June of 1860, it sunk. It was in um, poor conditions, and it was hit by um, a ship that was um, basically carrying coal. And the ship that, it, that hit it kept on going, thinking, oh, yeah, it hasn't had much damage. And shortly, the ship actually sunk, um, about 13 miles off the coast of New Jersey, um, specifically off the coast of Atlantic City. There was a lighthouse um, that they could actually see from the ship um, when it sunk. Um, about 70 people actually made it off the boat and made it to shore. Um, but 20 did not. This is actually the single largest loss of life for the Coast Survey and NOAA um, on a research expedition. OK, so that's the background. This happened in 1860. Right around that time, we had this, this war that started, the Civil War. So um, very little attention was paid to the fact that the ship had sunk. There was not really an investigation and so on. So fast forward to 2010 or so, um, people started really being interested in trying to find the ship. They knew where it sunk because they had eyewitness testimony. I mean, people were there, and they made it to shore, and they knew where it sunk. Um, but specifically where it was, nobody knew. So they started this project. And also the, um, the Explorers Club was involved in this expedition as well. And basically, they started surveying. Um, they started doing a marine archaeology project. They started surveying all of the known shipwrecks off the coast of New Jersey. Turns out that this particular wreck was known. Um, it was known as the $25 wreck, um, so named because someone sold someone the coordinates um, for this particular wreck um, for $25 so that they could go fishing um, or diving. Um, but that's the name that stuck right up until um, 2014, when it was confirmed that this wreck was, in fact, the Robert J. Walker. So NOAA did some of the initial work, um, but um, some of the more specific work was done locally. And Stockton um, used its side scan sonar to actually map the shipwreck and then build a diagram of that map. So um, they were able to interpret um, the side scan sonar image to figure out where the bow was, where the paddle wheels were, and everything. Um, so they built this diagram, and this diagram was then used by a team of local divers that actually dove the wreck, measured things, and basically brought back evidence that this was absolutely positively the Robert J. Walker. Here's a close-up of the sonar of the Robert J. Walker. This is um, the bow section, and there's an anchor that you can see there. It looks even cooler when you actually see it in person underwater. So um, here's one of the divers who is actually doing some measurements 
to try and make sure to figure out um, how big the wreck is to see if it actually makes sense. Here's another anchor. And I'm actually showing these specific locations for a reason. And I will get back to that in just a moment. Um, here's the starboard paddle wheel. Um, and that's what it looks like in person. So I'm showing you these locations because this particular project, um, my specific work in my lab um, is actually kind of piggybacking on this project. And what we've done is we've dove on this wreck. Um, we've collected coral samples from all of these locations, and we've also collected sediment samples from these locations. So students in my classes have been able to sequence um, DNA from the corals that are found on this shipwreck. I have other students who are working on the metagenomics, trying to figure out what other stuff is in the sediment. So these students are basically um, adding to this project. This particular site has become a national marine sanctuary. So NOAA is very interested in this particular site. And um, it's really, the students that I have are really excited that they actually get to participate in this project. And I just want to acknowledge those who have done this work. Um, again, my research students, um, all of my current research students um, are listed and then the, the former students whose work I've talked about. I also need to thank Dr. Pete Straub, who is our current dean. Um, but before he was dean, he was my um, collaborator. So um, some of the work he did, some of the work I did, um, and we involved our research students. I also want to thank um, Steve Nagowitz, who was the expedition leader um, of this project. And um, we have funding for this work um, through the National Science Foundation to actually get our equipment. And, oops. Um, these are some of my research students who are working in the lab right now. Um, and if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And I'm sorry for the technical difficulties at the beginning. Okay, so the question is, how do we know that the, what we find in the sediment is specifically associated with that, sh that ship and not naturally occurring elsewhere? Um, and the answer to your question is, we don't, because um, at this point, this is really preliminary work. Um, we've taken samples from various shipwrecks. We've also taken samples from outside locations. And at this point, um, we're still in that data analysis stage. Um, people haven't actually done this in this area. So people don't actually know what you would find at one of these sites. Um, so this is really new research. Um, so at this point with the metagenomics work, we're not specifically saying, oh yeah, these guys are here because it's a shipwreck. Um, but again, we're collecting samples from multiple places in order to compare, to kind of figure out if you see a pattern. Yep? When you're actually mapping this um, uh, from a distance, are you using a gamma, a, a gamma neutron tool to do it with? So we're using sonar. We're using side scan sonar. So basically, we're sending out sound waves. Just sound waves. Just sound waves. Okay. Have you ever considered doing gamma neutron? Um, we have not. Um, I don't see any reason not to do it other than we don't have the equipment. Um, these pieces of equipment are extremely expensive. I think the side scan sonar alone is something like $60,000. Um, the ROV was about $120,000. So um, again, we are a public college, so you know, we do not have unlimited funding. Um, so basically, we're kind of working with what we have. But I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be able to do that if we had the equipment to do so.
Very cool. Thank you for the suggestion. Yes. Right. Okay, so the question is, um, what's the value of an artificial reef off the coast of New Jersey? So New Jersey is flat, and it's basically sandy, um, and right off the coast until you hit the continental shelf, I'm sorry, the continental slope, um, you have sand. You don't have a lot of hard structure. So um, when you don't have hard structure, you don't have cover. So um, artificial reefs, and again, they can be shipwrecks, um, they can be, uh, one thing they do is sometimes they throw um, something called reef falls, basically these concrete castings into the water to provide habitat for fish um, and other organisms to grow. Um, not just corals, corals need something hard to actually colonize, and so do mussels and things like that. But having these structures that have holes and crannies and things like that are perfect areas um, for um, nesting for fishes. Um, they're spawning grounds, so these are areas where you find juvenile um, fishes or there's places they can hide from the larger um, predators. So um, people actually started doing this because, um, again, fishing is a, is a very big um, industry out there, um, not only industry but also for recreation. And what they've found is, you know, you have, you have your favorite fishing spot. And what they've found is people's favorite fishing spots seemed to always be over some sort of a hard structure. Um, and they thought, huh, this is interesting. Maybe if we start putting down more hard structures, we'll actually provide more habitat. So they started putting things down like old um, army tanks. Um, that worked out pretty well. Um, they also put down, again, these concrete castings, um, tugboats, you know, ships and boats that were um, done um, with their useful life. They would sink them to provide hard surface. Um, these all worked out really well. The subway cars, not so much. Um, when they sunk the subway cars, and again, they're, they're, they're stainless steel, that's all great. Um, the bolts and things holding them together were not. So when the bolts disintegrate in salt water, um, big sheets of metal start falling off them, and those started causing a problem, but they don't do that anymore. Um, but the fact is, these artificial reefs um, provide this habitat, and they draw um, fish and other things to this area. Um, and again, this increases the, the fishing and things like that. So the problem with this is, again, as I mentioned, they just started putting random things out there. But no one had actually studied trying to figure out you know, our little concrete, ca well, little, like the size of me, concrete castings, helpful, or do they need really big objects like tanks, or what kind of objects actually attract what kind of fishes, because no one had actually been able to do some of this monitoring. So that's how we really got started with the artificial reef work. We would take out the ROV, and we would survey. Um, if you send divers down, fish are going to start swimming away. You send down the ROV, they're going to pretty much ignore it. So we were able to take some high-quality video um, over the course of pretty much every, just about every month um, from, I guess, I guess, March through November. Um, and we were actually able to see seasonal variation and things like that. So um, anyway, that's the very long-winded answer to your question. This particular, so the question was this particular expedition that sunk um, around 1860, um, where um, all but 20 of the, um, the um, crew survived, um, were they doing any particular type of research? And the answer is yes. What they were doing is mapping um, shipping routes and coastline, and now we do that with sonar. We actually use sonar to kind of look at the topology of the, um, the um, seafloor. The way they did that then was very, very different. Um, they used something called a lead line. 
which is pretty much exactly what you think. They took a lump of lead or some, something heavy, tied it to the end of a rope, and they dropped it down. And basically, they took depth measurements that way. And you had to drop these lines um, hundreds and thousands of times to actually get accurate um, maps, things that we can do now in you know, a 20-second pass. So um, that's the research that they were doing. They were mapping the coastline and mapping the shipping routes. Yes? Okay, so um, it's murkier near the surface than at depth, but um, diving on shipwrecks um, in the North Atlantic is very, very challenging. We use sonar to actually find them, but once you're there, um, it's not like if you're diving in the Caribbean where you can see what's going on. You actually have to have a line directly from, um, an anchor line from the boat down to um, the shipwreck itself. And then you basically take a, wa a line that you, you clip on to that and you navigate around the wreck. And then once you're, you know, it's about half your air is left, you turn around and you follow that line back. Otherwise, you absolutely will get lost. Um, I, you always go down with a dive buddy. Um, the first time I dove on the um, Robert J. Walker, my dive buddy was five feet in front of me. Um, I bent down to look at my air gauge. I looked up, and she was gone. Um, eventually, it all worked out. We found each other. It's all good. But it's that hard to see. Um, sometimes the visibility is only five feet. Sometimes the visibility is greater, like 10 feet or, or 15 feet. But again, it's really hard to navigate um, in, that sort of a in that sort of situation. If, you're, if you don't have that line that's attaching you to um, the anchor line, you will absolutely get lost. So you don't do it if you're claustrophobic. Yes. Okay, so the question is, there are a lot of shipwrecks in this area. Um, why did we focus on these two particular wrecks um, instead of the others? And in the first place, um, it is not, I would love to say that we had really great ideas that, you know, it, it has to do with what they're made of and things like that. Um, but the Almirante is a wreck that has been um, dove heavily. The commercial dive vessels actually go to that particular ship an awful lot. So um, it's very easy to actually get to the Almirante. So that's why we chose that particular ship. Um, the Robert J. Walker we chose because of this mapping project. So again, my project is specifically looking at the DNA of the corals and the microorganisms and things that you find there. But the actual project to identify the ship, um, to map it, um, and it eventually um, to designate it as a national marine sanctuary, um, was kind of a bigger project. So um, the, um, one of the expedition leaders, Steve Nagowitz, um, who also um, teaches at Stockton, um, but he also teaches at Atlantic City High School, um, was really um, pivotal in this project. And when I told him I was thinking of maybe expanding my DNA analysis project, um, and I suggested possibly the Robert J. Walker, he was extremely excited. Um, to have this kind of data um, available for this particular site. So this particular, again, it was, it was because it was there and this is what people were working on and um, we were able to get some good data. Um, in the future, we would like to more systematically go along and see what sort of differences we might find on a metal versus a wooden hauled ship. And we've got lots of wooden hauled ships. Um, there are actually shipwrecks um, from the American Revolution. Um, that are still available that we've actually mapped with our sonar. So um, there is no shortage of ships. Um, this particular area is referred to as Shipwreck Alley um, because, again, this is one of the major shipping areas um, on the East Coast. And um, again, ships have been sinking there for 200 years or so, maybe 
longer. So um, again, when you're working at a small college, um, when you're working with undergraduates, and when you're working on a budget, um, sometimes you kind of, you take what you can get with the hopes that you can write a grant that will allow you to expand the project. So that is really um, the intention. But that's also a very good question. Tim. How do you decide who it is on the team that should be dismissed? <laughs> very good. Actually, that's a very good question. So obviously not related to the research, but um, <laughs> so um, in case you're unfamiliar, um, Quidditch is a sport that was originally um, was originally um, conceived of by um, J.R., um, I'm sorry, um, J.K. Rowling um, in the Harry Potter books. And basically, um, this version that about 10 years ago or so, um, a group of students in Vermont came up with official rules for a muggle Quidditch, where basically, obviously, the broomsticks don't fly, but it's kind of like rugby on, on brooms. So. It's actually a lot more um, serious than it sounds. Um, students get really, really into this sport. Um, typically, um, so the snitch, if you remember in Harry Potter, is a small little golden um, ball with wings that flies. Not really practical um, for Muggle Quidditch. So what we do is we have a student, typically a cross-country runner, who dresses in yellow. Um, <laughs> And he has basically a tennis ball and a sock stuck in the back of his shorts, or her shorts. And 16 minutes into the game, the snitch is released and he starts running around. And at that point, the two um, seekers can actually start going and chasing after him or her. So um, basically, the fastest endurance runner that you can have um, is your snitch. Yes. Bludgers are, <laughs> bludgers are actually um, deflated um, kickballs. Not really, really deflated, but deflated a little bit because you actually throw them at the other players. So if someone has the quaffle, which is a volleyball basically, um, um, the um, chasers start throwing the bludgers at them. If it hits them, they have to fall off their broom, which basically means they have to actually walk back to the goalposts, tag up, and then start back up again. So yeah, that's, they, they don't actually move on their own. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well thank you very much for having me.